Hello, welcome to episode 99 of Fear of a Black Planet. I'm hoping that this room is not too echoey. Um, so, anyway, <coughs> I, hope, <coughs> I hope it isn't unbearable to listen to, basically. <coughs> Shit, my voice is, for some reason, it's not like I've been speaking very much today. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's because I've barely spoken today, and this room is incredibly fucking echoey. And I'm getting self-conscious about my voice, and it's essentially husky and sort of broken for some reason. Possibly just because I'm tired. But I realised something that I wanted to particularly talk about this week uh, to do with silliness and creative process. And I had a realisation about my own creative process and just thinking about the times when I've been most open to the imagination, most open to my unconscious, most open to, and, and actually most successful in expressing myself or, exp or expressing a creative idea. And it was, and also felt that rare kind of connected euphoria that you feel when things just connect and, and, and a kind of flow state type feeling and actually it was well back in 2012 I was in the cherry orchard Chekhov's cherry orchard just a kind of amdram type thing and it was quite a big role and I hadn't done any acting for years and I was always as I've probably said before on the podcast I've the only thing I was good at at school was acting. It's the only thing I got recognised for being any, you know, sort of having any ta standout talent in. And um, I did a bit of acting at school, but then when I left school, went to university and I did sort of like some silly little plays, some sort of, you know, nothing too serious. But a couple of years after I moved down to London, I was sort of deciding, do I want to focus particularly on the music and poetry or do I want to take up this acting stuff again because it was it was the thing that people said I was good at. So anyway, I experimented with it and I, <clears throat> I got this part out of the blue which was pretty interesting in and of itself. And it, when you're doing Chekhov as well, it's proper sort of method. You know, you, this is about the only way you can approach it um, because it's so subtle and everything's between the lines. And so the challenge of bringing this stuff to life really requires psychological work because the because the point he's making is very psychological. So I enjoyed that and I enjoyed immersing myself in it. And I did all the things right up about that era and Russia and blah, blah, blah and, and really immersed my imagination in it, which is part of the fun of doing a play. But one day we were workshopping a scene and for some reason I was in a good mood and for some reason everybody, the, the cast, although doing Amdram can be a bit, it can be like a collection of neurotics, you know, and everybody's like living a kind of shitty life and trying to express themselves in this play, you know, trying this one moment in their life that their soul is coming alive is kind of what it was like, it was probably what it was like for me. And uh, anyway, it was just some for some reason. One afternoon, when we were work out, workshopping quite a psychologically deep scene, and it was just me and this other woman. We were both main parts, and, we were, and it was a critical scene, and it's a very Chekhov scene, very serious. Uh, although you find out that the image of Chekhov as this serious psychological thing is not strictly speaking um, legitimate or doesn't much justice because he is comedic but the comedy is psychological and ironic and all that but it, he's not just serious but this was this was one of those critical serious scenes that brought out the nature of the, the characters and the relationship and all that shit um, but for some reason beforehand I was goofing around and the goofing around 
doing imitate like kind of when I was at school, you know, where I would entertain the class if the teacher hadn't turned up and I would just get up and dance around and make a fucking arse of myself and imitate the teachers and imitate people and just kind of be a kind of just get into trickster mode really. And uh, I and the for some reason, just imitate. I think what I was doing was I ended up imitating. Before this workshop was started, we were waiting for someone, and I think what I was doing was I was imitating other people doing their parts. <laughs> so, and uh, people were laughing and got really into it, and it was one of those moments. I think one of the things that comes out of a situation like that is you feel safe. So that's a kind of creative thing, isn't it? Like necessary part of the process you've got to feel safe you've got to feel like your environment is nourishing i've done a, many podcasts on exactly that issue particularly you remember quoting bob dylan saying that if you know if you're not in the right environment if your soul's not being fed then it's not going to happen but so already that's a prerequisite which i recognize but I, I, the after after we did the scene, it was really good. We were, it was very explorative, and I love that workshop sort of situation. You can kind of fuck up and make mistakes and experiment. It's just creative exploration. It's like a painter playing with a canvas, just seeing what works, redoing colours, remixing colours. It's that kind of feel, you know, and I love that. Um, and then afterwards, we went for a drink at the Young Vic, and I just felt this complete high, exactly what people talk about when they say, find your passion, man, find what makes your soul sing, all those things that sound like bullshit. But it was really one of those moments where I go, God, this feels good. Because it was like a combination of, yes, the validation, the need for validation, the need to be seen as brilliant, but also the need to connect with others. All these things locked into place, but there was a real meaningful sense of fulfillment that came out of it as well and, I, and the only way I can describe it was just this kind of lightness and this high this sort of sort of summary lightness and beauty to the moment and, and just a fulfillment uh, that I haven't I couldn't really say I've had since maybe in, maybe it flashes of it after gigs but it wasn't an ego high. It wasn't like, oh, everybody loves me. I got an applause. It wasn't that. It was because it was a, it was just people goofing around. There was no applause. There was no one that said, oh, that was great. Although one person did say, what was so good about, what was so different today that made it so good? But he wasn't saying you're amazing. It was more like, how the hell did that happen? And I think that the, the missing thing, the, the thing that didn't strike me at the time, maybe it did and I forgot about it, but just struck me the other day looking back at that and what got me into that creative state of being was the silliness, the goofing around part. And I know myself it's very easy to, to diminish that part. So that's something that I've been mulling over in the last couple of days that... Silliness, playfulness, mischief, trickster energy is part of my process. And, it, and, it, uh, <clears throat> and I think that too often with, and this is part of the problem with the, the way of looking at creative industries, which is an oxymoron, you know, the, uh, and turning creativity into some kind of engine of the economy and the knowledge economy and all that sort of stuff, that creativity has now become this engine of the economy. And people talk about, oh, we should really value creativity, you know, we, we should really turn to that because creativity solves problems. Well, I say, well, actually, that's that's not what gets me in the zone. In fact, that will put me out of the zone. Uh, because the, the thing that happens when you're being silly is you're, you're just completely spontaneous in the moment. And you're not self-conscious. That's the, that's the critical thing. That, that lack of self-consciousness gives you access to your unconscious without you even knowing it. It's, um, and it's also, you could say, some people might say, well, that's not very serious, it might be good for comedy, but it, I mean, I was doing a serious scene there. So I think it's very interesting that as much as it was goofing around and as much as there was silliness, it wasn't just frivolous. It, it was, uh, there was a sort of, 
depth to it. I could I can remember feeling that depth when I was imitating people and and making people laugh and sort of playing up to the crowd and being a bit of a lovey. The there was a sort of depth to it. I felt very rooted in who I was. I felt very me. And whether or not people agree with this way of going about creativity, I think that's the feeling you've got to go for. Where do you feel most yourself? It could be if you're walking in nature. You know, it could be multiple places. It doesn't need to be one. And, it, and maybe you don't have that euphoria I'm talking about. But where do you feel most like you recognise yourself, like you recognise who you are. And it, and I would say if you don't have, if that still eludes you because your conscious mind is going, no, not that, not that, not that, then list the things that definitely don't. When do you definitely know you're not feeling, you don't recognise yourself, you don't feel connected to who you are, you feel distant from who you are. That's easy enough, and I think that you can work it out that way, probably. Um and then that, that will that will start to bring into your conscious imagination areas where you you actually feel the opposite of that and actually feel a positive sense of self and meaningfulness. But I just thought it was interesting that the playfulness, the silliness, the trickster nature of just goofing and fucking around and, and mimicking and, and being a kid. And it's not to say or oh, creativity is just about being a big kid. That's not what I'm saying. Because the reason why I bring it up is that I see now my, my challenge as an artist is probably to see how can I integrate that into an actual practical form of working? How can I make sure that I'm accessing that energy and therefore accessing that mental state of playfulness and uh, unself-consciousness. And I, I, get, I guess what I'm trying to commu uh, communicate about what it felt like is that it, it, as much as it was silly, there was a silliness, there was a, I, in that state of silliness, I feel a sense of command. I feel a sense of power. But it isn't power over others, it's power in the moment. It's an, an empowered, creative state. And, yeah, that, that is interesting. That is actually very interesting. So the challenge is how to integrate it, how to create a process. And I suppose that's a difficult question, an elusive question. So that when you have an elusive question, you do the Lockean thing. Or well, when is it? When? What would be a bad process given what I know? What would be the? What What would be the limits of this process? What, what In what areas would this not be happening? So I suppose that's a good way of trying to get a creative process. Figure out when you're not creative, and then figure out spaces that avoid those things figure out methods, ways of living, attitudes, yeah, social company where those things that you know definitely do not serve your creative state of being as an artist. Find out what they are and what would be a viable way in daily life, in your practical life, to avoid them and therefore be more likely to encourage that. And I'm just trying to think. Well, for a good example for me would be rush hour during the tube. I mean, there's just fuck all creative about that. I mean, to be honest, this morning I had a little bit of a moment. I was going up to Liverpool Street in the rush hour, and I did have a sort of positive thought. I could see it was very busy, and I could see everybody around me. But I just got this. I was just. I think I was probably just in a decent mood. I don't know though, I mean I was as anxious and fucking distracted as usual but something struck me anyway, unusually because I'm usually very grumpy and the more I live in London the, the more um, what's the word uh, what's the word misanthropic <laughs> I get and I didn't used to be really at all misanthropic but you know Maybe it's quite a, kind of healthy because there's a point where you can be too idealistic about human nature and that can be dangerous. 
but obviously extremes on both sides are not good. So, But anyway, I had a very unmisanthropic um, feeling this morning where I just thought, I just felt that like there was a real heroism to everybody that was going, ooh. People were just getting on with it. I could see people reading their book. I could see couples smooching. I could see people just sort of meditating. Um, and But there was a sort of, I just, I just saw the strength in everyone around me in what they were doing. And it wasn't a haggard, beleaguered sense of strength. It was a, there was just a real sense of like human resilience and, and complete lack of self-pity. I think that was what struck me about it. And I, I, I wouldn't be able to claim that for myself. <laughs> most times when I'm on the tube, I have to say, yeah, it's probably the most likely feeling I would have on the tube is self-pity, which is a good example of a state of being that's non-creative. But that was interesting. But more often than not, that's a rare case. And I, that's a rare case because I've got such an attitude when I'm on the tube. I'm not saying anything about anyone else. Um, but it's just not the environment to feel empowered, connected, uh, and unselfconscious for me. In fact, that would be the real predominant feeling is self-consciousness on the tube. It's like being forced into the gaze of others, which I hate. And maybe one of the things that locked me into that all those years ago was, and maybe I've always done this, not maybe, I know it myself, and using humour to get past that self-consciousness or social awkwardness. So that being the joke guy was always a way of fooling the people around me that I wasn't who I actually am, which is quite a socially awkward, shy, weirdo. <laughs> and it's taken me until my... It took me in well into my 30s to realise that that... And only in the last couple of years have I really integrated the fact and faced up to it. But I am a socially awkward weirdo. Um, so maybe there's an element of the, the defence mechanism and the, the, the humour can take, it, take away the awkwardness and self-consciousness in that sense. But... In a play, those tactics are not sustainable because because you, you're going to have to face up to your bullshit at some point if you want to be a truly creative artist and truly get into the play and truly immerse yourself in the character and truly do the job. So that's at best half the story. I really think that... Um, and, and you wouldn't get that depth, that profound, profound sense of power and depth which I was talking about. So... Despite the silliness, there was a sense of rootedness and, and um, confidence, unselfconscious confidence. Uh, and that you can't trick yourself into that. You can't just tell a joke and get yourself into that state of being. So there's something there's something quite profound about this silliness, a profound silliness. That's the the, um, the thing I'm trying to trying to go for paradoxically and so that's probably why in drama classes and uh, some of the more out there methods of, of teaching acting you end up having to be like a tree and all that sort of shit because it just gets you into that unselfconscious thing but, but one of the things but one of the things I really want to emphasize the silliness of course sometimes that can get a bit serious as well and, and no matter what art you're in you can start persecuting yourself about your creative method and you can start sort of being being your own whipping boy and that's that's not going to work you can't um, drive yourself into creativity with the whip you can do it you can do it and I've, to some extent, I've done that a bit today. I made quite a rigid schedule for myself today and had quite a lot to get through, and I think that maybe, I, I've, as ironically enough, I do this podcast <laughs> talking about the very opposite. I think I've been a bit too serious today. Um, and treating it like a business, treating it like a day, is a day at the office, and I'm not into that. I think that you know, 
and that's not to say you can't be like Nick Cave, you know, who goes to his, who has his sort of study, gets dressed up in a suit and, and hits it by eight o'clock in the morning. I think that's fine. But you cannot be psychologically treating it like an office, if you know what I mean. He's still playful. He's still allowing ideas to come. He's still um, being experimental and open and that and it's it's a difficult thing to get. This is something I've talked about many times before, but my challenge, I'm not saying I have the answer, but my challenge here is to to find a way to be silly and daft and playful and tricksterish and act like a fanny while still creating a frame of reference for the day not it, for it not to be this just this sort of wheels off and craziness which is what I was like as a child actually <laughs> and that's why you know, my parents despaired and I got thrown out of boarding school was ultimately not because I was a, uh, that much of a rebel really it was more that I was just too manic you know, and I think that's the challenge. But some of, but the problem is, some of that mania really needs to be, to be harnessed. And so, <clears throat> I think that as an, I, I actually, I don't think I really believe this. Actually, I think there's a little bit too much with all this creative industry. Everyone's got a fucking MacBook. Everyone's an artist, kind of thing that's going on today. Not to say we're not all creative. We are all creative, but. The artist should be transgressive. The artist shouldn't behave. The artist should be slightly wearing on normal civilians. I really think that. It's not the business of the artist to make other people around them feel good about themselves. It's not the business of the artist to make people feel secure, to not, um, to, to not be, you know, to be appropriate. There is something essentially inappropriate about living a life devoted to the to the creative state of being to, to to being an artist. You can be creatively appropriate. You can be a designer in a in an advertising company. You can be a copywriter. You can be a creative person in your own time with your hobbies. That's different. That's fine. That's healthy. That I do believe the hippies who say that we are all creative, but there's something transgressive and um, disruptive and to some extent, destructive about being a creative individual. And perhaps that was what the, the silliness I was talking about, that there was, there was something, something slightly edgy and um, unsettling and strange about that silliness. And maybe that was part of it. I mean, it's all this is all just speculation because it's, we're fucking mysteries unto ourselves, and no more is that true than with artists. We we, we and and it ought to be true. We should not. What one thing I can say the answer is in terms of a process is that I'm increasingly beginning to learn you cannot control this shit. You cannot control this shit. Um, I'm just doing a class in, in, in something today where the teacher was saying you can't control it. You, it's just, you can only suggest and stimulate the imagination. And I think that that's true. I think that we you just have to kind of follow your gut on on what works. And <clears throat> maybe this is the maybe this is the revelation the that, that, that needs to be integrated is that when I'm blocked, when it isn't working, perhaps the answer is silliness. Perhaps the answer is, but not silliness in a kind of like, oh, isn't that, not cutesy silliness. That's, I think, what I was trying to say about it. It was not cutesy silliness. There's something slightly provocative and edgy and slightly um, disconcerting and Dionysian about the silliness. And... Yeah, actually, when I just when I say it like that, that is actually exactly what it is for me. And I think one of the things I've got to get over is, you know, you can't you can't be like that and be worrying about what other people think or what. And maybe when I was a kid, I, I did used to fall back on that silliness because I knew it was the only thing that was kind of keeping me sane. And I was very much told not to be like that, and it was very much wearing on our people. But I'm not a kid now, and I don't have to answer to anyone, so maybe that's it. 
but people will look down upon you. People will think you're crazy, narcissistic, manic, um, dangerous, um, out of order, inappropriate, rude, all those things. And, and, and I think that one of the things that we have to... This is probably one of one of the many reasons I get so pissed off with the PC types here, is because that finger wagging attitude is all based on exteriors. It's not based on the. No one ever says, "Oh, he used this word, but maybe what was going on inside his heart." No one ever asks that. No one ever asks, "Oh, what's the complexity of this person?" It's completely lacking in nuance, and it's completely lacking in any sense of interiority to the person, which is what really matters in morality. And that's what we need to remember as artists: that whatever people say about us, whatever people think about our silliness, our stupidity, our mania, our um, inappropriateness, what matters is in your heart. What matters is, are you a moral person in, in your conviction and inwardness, like I was saying when I read my Kierkegaard essay. That's the key. It's an existential thing. It's not about what people think they think they know. Because they don't know. They don't know. And they certainly cannot know by me, by applying generalizations like political correctness. That's It's a generalization, top-down model of human behavior that bears no account of individuality at all at all anyway on that point actually I want to talk about this free speech stuff because someone pissed me off the other day one of my mates <clears throat> let me just bring up my notes here um, yeah. they were saying basically the argument that free speech is privilege that the only people who defend free speech are people who are white middle class and privilege because you know they're not they're not dealing with poverty or disadvantaged people or di or the disenfranchisement of, of of certain races in society. They're just obsessed by getting being able to say what they want to say. That's essentially the argument, right? This is horseshit of the most enormous kind of smelly green horseshit. Okay, free speech is the opposite of privileged and elitist. It is the opposite. Because the because if you look at the First Amendment of the American Constitution, the whole idea is that not any one view has the privilege or protection from the state. That means that all ideas are held to be of uh, equal standing in terms of the law, not equally valuable in terms of what they're actually, the ideas, but equally valuable in terms of the right to express them and equally unbound by the law. <clears throat> and what that means is, however you apply, whether it's the First Amendment to the Constitution or just the sort of governing uh, principle of free speech that exists in the UK, the basic intuition there is that no idea is privileged over any other idea. And the only way you can maintain that idea of avoiding any idea being privileged over the other is to not protect any one idea from being criticised. It's sort of a paradoxical thing that if you're going to start protecting one idea over other, another idea from being criticised or satirised or ridiculed in a certain way, then you, are, then you are actually creating privilege. And the only way you can avoid that privilege coming in is by making sure that all ideas are equally open to discussion and debate. That's the key. So it's actually the opposite of privilege. And I would also say it's the only way to guard against bad ideas, to have free speech. Like the only, like, you can say that, but hate is more than just a bad idea, it's damaging. Yes, but the, 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 the only way to challenge that would be to challenge the governing ideas. So the only way to challenge, like, the Nazi hate and this, was the, this is always the problem with totalitarianism is, is they start privileging their ideas above anyone else and, and saying that certain ideas are beyond criticism. And that and certain and only certain ideas are expressed on the on the airwaves. And that's the that's when you start getting the problem. Because people can't criticize, because ideas are not open to um, critical analysis. So bad ideas can flourish 
without free speech. That's the problem. Bad ideas can always become more toxic and more embedded, and 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 they kind of have a privilege if you if you can't criticize. Um, <clears throat> and you could and, and people who think, well, we're, we're only saying that you know most ideas you can criticize, but except these ones. Well, I say the minute you bring that in, you're basically bringing in the the concept. There's a precedent for privilege of an idea and it's the precedent for privilege of an idea that free speech is the only antidote to so it doesn't matter if your idea is in fact moral or good and you're trying to protect it the minute you say this idea needs protection from criticism is beyond criticism then like say like uh islam you know, the, the, you can't criticize islam in the same way you can criticize the catholic church which is effectively the dogma of the age given the reaction to the Charlie Hebdo killing. The minute you do that, and you might be right, let's just say for the sake of argument you're right, that the, 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 uh, the Islamic religion is the religion of the downtrodden um, non-whites and therefore doesn't uh, have the same privilege as the religion of the Catholics, so they need better, more protection because it's punching down, right? Let's say you're right, but the thing is, if, if you bring in the precedent of that, then you then you allow future claims to being punched downward to to start coming up, and anyone can anyone. Who, this is the problem with political correctness and identity politics. Anyone who starts adopting that language is exactly what the white racists do. They start adopting the language of persecution, and by doing that, they, they assume a legitimacy and they and actually assume a, a privilege of protection. To themselves, that's exa- that their whole propaganda tactic is that tactic, and that's the precedent that free speech avoids. But there's another point here. Free speech is also the only way to ensure that the abuse of good ideas doesn't happen, right? Because having bad ideas is a different from having good ideas that are abused, and this I think this is much more of a bigger problem. And the, and the only way you can do that is, is through nuance. So an example of of, an, of a good idea that's often abused would be equality, where people start confusing equality of opportunity with equality of outcome. So you say, well, we if we don't have 50-50% per, women, it's it's bigotry. If we don't have, uh, uh, you know, 50-50% for, admissions for, for black students as white students, then it's racism. These, that's an abuse of the, the central good idea of equality. Another example which you find on the right and which is often uh, thrown at the right is individuality. Individuality is, is, is one of the central uh, ideas of, of Judeo-Christian culture and uh, it, what I would say the Western civilization is the idea that there's something that the, the, there's something uh, the individuals are an end in themselves. The sort of that he finds its crystallization in the Kantian version I suppose um, the secular version but it emerges out of Christianity so that idea that individuals are ends in themselves that they are that they're not valued according to anything else other than simply what they are that they're intrinsically valuable as individuals that can become an emphasis on individuality can obviously become very easily propagandized into an emphasis on selfishness and uh, or solipsism or egotism or or the economic libertarians version of uh, you know the kind of abuse of the Adam Smith idea that you know the the, the 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 only answer is just to let individuals fulfill their own selfishness and therefore and and and, and the the general good capital G will emerge from that. And that can be used to justify all sorts of stupidities, even though there's a grain of truth in it. There's a grain, and it emerges from that Judeo-Christian idea of individuality. <clears throat> and the only way, and this is the thing, this is the thing, it, it, that the people who argue against free speech and, and, and slander and scandalize the, those of us who defend it, and the people who defend political correctness and identity politics, they do not, do not, do not have nuance. 
They can only say, it's a bad idea, and therefore it's bad, man. It's like, yeah, but what happens when certain ideas which are, having, uh, are, which are becoming toxic are actually emerging from good ideas? How about that? What have you got to say about that? I'll tell you what you've got to say about that. Not a fucking thing. You've got not a fucking thing to say about that. Because there's no nuance in the ideology. And the, the only way to bring nuance is to make sure that at the core of society is the idea of disputation, debate, discussion, dialogue. And how do you maintain that? Free fucking speech. Ultimately, the guiding principle behind my defense of free speech is that I think free speech is synonymous with the idea of accountability. That if you don't have some cultural privilege of free speech, if you don't privilege that as one of the key rights, uh, in that sense I use the word privilege for the, in a different way than I was accused of, um, if you don't place free speech at the core of society, then you take away, or you compromise accountability, because it's only through challenge, because civil rights would not have happened if people had not been able to make their voice heard, right? Workers' rights, freedom of association, freedom to, 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 to protest, freedom to, to voice. You know, I mean, this is the thing. Marx, Marx's first battles were with the Prussian state over what he was allowed to say. It was a matter of censorship. So the whole workers' movement would not have happened without free speech. And it began with free speech. It begins with free speech because all social change starts with accountability. And if you start limiting free speech, then you start to limit accountability because you're effectively saying there are certain things which are beyond challenging. And and you might you might you might say that certain people are more vulnerable than others, so therefore they are more protected. But if you the minute you grant that then you grant a, a, a precedent for everyone else, and you, and and the, and I, again, I would recommend reading Nadine Strawson's book on hate because she talks about this idea that free speech will end up um, making certain people more vulnerable than others because certain people are privileged and some people are. And she completely debunks it, and she says actually, hate speech laws, laws that limit speech on the basis of the damage they can do to certain communities almost always end up damaging minorities rather than protecting them. But the central idea behind my defence of free speech is that it is the beginning of accountability and therefore it's the beginning of social change. It's the beginning of the fight for justice, the fight for truth, the fight against propaganda, the fight against exploitation. It doesn't happen unless you get your voice heard. And the way to make the only antidote to sil being silenced is to have your voice heard and demand that your voice is heard. Right? So the only way that hate speech can actually do damage is when the person who is the victim of it is silenced. And so the answer to hate is free speech. I'm going to leave it there. The answer to hate is free speech. The answer to hate is free speech.